Women Taking the Lead, Episode 197. I think one of the practices that I I try to do is, I'm going to say check my own biases and sort of think about the filter that I'm looking at a situation through because my filter for something might be very different than someone else's. And so when I'm tackling a, a work situation or a junior league situation or a home situation, I try to take a step back for a moment and say, okay, my, my like inherent bias going into this is X, Y, and Z. And I need to know that because that's how I'm going to approach this problem or this issue or this question. And I hopefully, like, hopefully that makes me a better leader slash mom slash wife slash business person <laughs> because that hopefully makes me a little bit more aware. Am I always really good at this? No. But I will say that sometimes in retrospect, it helps me come around to things too. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Head over to womentakingthelead.com to join the community and get the resources to support you on your leadership journey. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Your website tells a story about your business. At Zebra Love Web Solutions, Millie and her team are going to make sure your website tells the story you want your customers to hear. Connect with Millie at zebralovewebsolutions.com to create the impression you want to make. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Katie Clark, who is the 2016-2017 president of the Junior League of Portland, Maine. The league, a community fixture in Portland for 94 years with more than 200 members, promotes volunteerism, develops the potential of women, and improves the community through the effective action and leadership of trained volunteers. Katie is also a market research and social media consultant, working with companies large and small in industries as varied as software, seafood, fragrance, and finance. Katie is a social media influencer and has been named to 10 great hashtag MRX tweeters every market researcher should follow most influential client-side tweeters, and the wearables 1K. She was selected as a Google Glass Explorer in 2013. Katie speaks at events and online about market research, social media, personal branding, technology, and productivity tools. She's a mom to identical twin three-year-old girls and an advocate for international adoption. Katie, it is an honor to have you on Women Taking the Lead. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And I know this overview, while comprehensive, (laughs) just touches the surface of what you have going on in your life. So if you could tell us more about you and your own humble beginnings. Absolutely. And Jody, thank you so much for having me here. It's it's an honor for me, and I'm an avid listener to the podcast and hearing about inspiring women. So it's exciting for me to be here. So humble beginnings. Wow. I won't go back all the way to the beginning, but I was uh, born and raised in Minnesota. So a very typical Midwestern upbringing. And as those of us who are in the Northeast now um, look at the snow and the cold, I say, yep, it's got nothing on Minnesota. (laughs) It's colder there. (laughs) Um, You know, very traditional, great family, great friends, very, um, you know, great school, large school. I think I have about 600 people in my graduating class. So it's a, uh, a lot of people to grow up with. And so I would say, you know, nothing super special about how I grew up. Um, I was really lucky to, again, be surrounded by great friends and family who supported me in um, all of the different things that I wanted to pursue. And for a girl from the Midwest, I will say sometimes it's interesting the pursuits that I chose. For instance, I wanted to be a fighter pilot when I was a kid. So interesting and different. And that's something that I pursued for a while. My eyesight didn't uh, make the cut, <laughs> let's say. Um, but that was something that really inspired me when I was younger. And uh, let's just say this was in the 80s. And the early 90s, and that's before women were really, really sort of prevalent in the military and in combat positions. So it was sort of an unusual thing to to voice 
that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. Did you get inspired by Top Gun? (laughs) Where did it come from? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I would say yes. And it's funny because my husband will joke that that is the one movie he probably doesn't want to watch with me because I can quote the entire thing beginning to end. Um, It was inspired by that, but also I was surrounded by, um, I had several friends whose fathers happened to be military pilots. So I got to hear some really interesting stories. And then I was lucky enough, and I know this is unusual, but I had the opportunity not once but twice to go to space camp in Alabama. So being surrounded by peers who have the same aspirations as you do, who may be, and I was going to say outcasts is not quite the right word, but if you're the kid in your school who wants to be an astronaut or a fighter pilot, that's somewhat unusual. Bringing all those kids together from all across the country and showing them really cool things. We got to play with some really cool toys and meet real live astronauts was really inspiring. And that sort of helped fuel the fire. Oh, my gosh, that is exciting. I mean, I think, you know, if you had proposed, you know, to a young child, would you want to be a fire pilot? Would you want to be an astronaut? Of course, they would say yes. But to find the child who is actively pursuing Mm -hmm. it, that is rare. That is rare. I love that. And you seem to go after things with gusto. That's the impression I get of you. And, you know, but you know, you and I both know we all have moments of self-doubt, you know, where we're not sure, where we hold ourselves back. And, you know, one of the first stories I, I, I asked my guests to share is a story of a playing small moment right from the Marianne Williamson quote. You know, those moments where we just don't realize how capable and powerful we are, but then in retrospect, we get it, we see it, we know it for what it is, but, we, you know, then we're on to the next moment <laughs> where we're holding ourselves back a little bit. So, Katie, if you could share with us uh, a story when of when you were playing small and the lessons you've learned from it. Sure. I, I, I can kind of think of two. So stop me if I keep on going on too long. Um, but the, the first thing that comes to mind is, so I went to Smith College, which is an amazing, amazing place. And um, I, I love pretty much everything about it. But one thing, and they know this because because uh, I used to do some admissions work for them. One of the things that is sort of conditioned into you at Smith is that they are creating women leaders. And that is something you hear from the moment that you step on campus and even before when you, you know, when you get accepted. And after that kind of conditioning for years and years, it's kind of, it becomes this unspoken expectation that your first job out of college is going to be saving the world. And you hear some of these success stories about women who have done that. You know, their first job out of college is working in the White House or their first job out of college is an amazing job in the Peace Corps. And for most of us, for the for, you know, 97 percent of us, that doesn't happen. And it takes us a while to build our career. And I would say it took me a long while to build my career to a place where I sort of felt solid. So when I first got out of college and then I went right to grad school, so right out of grad school, I felt honestly like I was not going to be a success because that first job wasn't any big deal. It was in the dot-com era in in Boston and I had a a number of great, actually looking back on it, really great jobs that were stepping stones to get me where I eventually got to. But at that time, I was very down on myself to say, oh, you know, I'm not saving the world quite yet. I'm not where some of my peers are. And that's something that, you know, it took a while to it would say, get over. Mm-hmm. But in retrospect, that's been beneficial to be able to sort of look back at that with eyes wide open. And in my position now, I, as I had said, I have done some admissions interviews for Smith, um, but I also have mentored some women um, who are interested in market research. So I've had long conversations with women who are, let's say, juniors and seniors in college, and they've had that same conditioning. And it's been lovely for me to be able to say, please don't expect that first job to be the end all and be all of your existence. Mm -hmm. You may hate it. You may love it. You might be indifferent to it. But here is what it can teach you. 
And then here's how you can take that learning to the next job and to the next job. I love that you're saying that, Katie, because this really runs the gamut. I think for entrepreneurs, you know, you, you, start your own business. And what you hear are all the success stories, how like people in their 20s, you know, in Silicon Valley are, you know, create these multi-million dollar businesses within six months and they get all this startup capital. And you start to feel like if if you're not a millionaire within the first couple of years of starting your business or well on your way, then you're lagging behind. And the reality is, is like that is not common at all, no. at all. In fact, most businesses fail. Right, right. Yes. And, and we don't celebrate that as much. And of course, you know, in our culture, and it is it is part of our culture to raise up those who break the mold. But we're mm-hmm. all not going to be Mark Zuckerberg, although that would be awesome. Right. We're not. <laughs> I think we need as many mentors who are, you know, who follow different paths. And that's why I love this podcast. Um, And, you know, and other ways of seeing, you know, women who have had interesting paths in life and who may have had multiple careers in life. And it all doesn't end. I will jokingly talk about the, you know, the 40 under 40 lists. Mm -hmm. And once I hit 40, I'm like, well, (laughs) clearly I'm not going to get on one of those lists anymore. (laughs) Is there a 40 over 40 list? Or a 50 uh, under 50? Does it just get bigger and the opportunities <laughs> expand? Right? I mean, we, we have that celebration of youth, and I think that's wonderful. You know, we need to celebrate all the different paths and also make it feel more comfortable for women who are growing in their career to know that there are going to be many paths set before them and many different opportunities. And, you know, especially with kids, like our kids came along last year when we adopted them. And, you know, that, uh, you know, charts a different course uh, when, you know, when people have kids. Right. So I think mentors in that area of there's lots of different options and life doesn't end at 40. You know, that's good. Good right. to know. Right. You know, and I love that you're bringing this up because, you know, I love goals. I'm a, I'm a big one for setting goals and going for the goal. But you, you make a good point. Like the goal isn't everything if you're not appreciating where you are right now. And in fact, oftentimes that's what will get you to the goal is focusing on and appreciating and doing your best with where you are right now. Exactly. Awesome. And Katie, now if you could share with us another story of a time in your life, this time when you had a wake up call, like it could have been a flashbulb aha moment or a a slow awakening, right? Sometimes people say the universe kept sending me messages till it hit me over the head, right? But in either case, there's usually a moment when you're ready to take action. So if you could share with us what led to that moment and then the steps you took that led to your success. Absolutely. And this is a story that very few people have heard. I actually shared it with a person last week who is in in need of a little mentoring. And I think it really helped. And it's interesting. So I was in a job a while back. And let's say all the signs were there that I had been there for a while, and it had stopped being the right fit for me. And it was involved a lot of travel. And it involved a lot of a lot of different stressors. And it was a place where, you know, there had been some layoffs and they kept on sort of taking that work of the people who had left and giving it to the people remaining and so on and so forth until there were very few people remaining who could do the work. And it got very stressful and very stressful. And I will say it started to affect my health. And I didn't really think about it too much. Now, my very smart husband sort of called me out on that. But it got to a point where all of those stressors kind of converged at the same time that I kind of hit a wall in terms of advancement at that company where they said, you know, you really can't advance. You can't go any further than you are, even though you've done the work of three people, unless you have managed people. And I hadn't done that yet. And I said, okay, you know, the universe is yelling at me at this point. And I could hear it because, again, I was having, you know, lots of, you know, sort of stress triggers. and, And I just wasn't super, super healthy. And I decided to take a really sort of unique side path, let's say, um, 
I knew that I wanted to advance in my career in general and not necessarily at that company. But I heard their guidance, which was you need to have you need to manage people in order to advance in your career. I also needed a break from that place and that industry. So I kind of put all those things together and said, what do I love? What's going to make me happy and what's going to get me to manage people? And this is where it sort of went sideways and interesting is I was going from, let's say, big sort of big tech uh, company and I was doing a lot of um, sort of customer management, I decided to go and assistant manage a bookstore. I love books. I could work in a bookstore all day, (laughs) which I did. And I knew, and this is sort of a a well-known fact, that the, the quickest way, the quickest job to sort of feet to the fire, jump into the deep end and managing people is in retail. And I knew I wasn't gonna do this forever, but I knew that this would be an interesting, interesting way to do that and also give me a break from sort of this high tech um, customer care, lots of travel craziness. And so I did. I quit my job and I ended up working at a Barnes and Noble in Massachusetts. And I will say and I've said to this day, if the, if the pay were better because retail doesn't pay well um, and if the hours were better and we all know retail hours, I would probably still be there. Mm -hmm. It was so much fun. And yes, of course, there were stressors. And, you know, all of the things that come along with retail management and managing people. But that was that first job where I really got to jump in and manage people. And I really discovered that I loved it. And I thrived on it. And I love the interaction with the customers. And again, books are one of my favorite things. So I could do that all day, forever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was an interesting, it was an interesting way to sort of get to that decision. And then being in that role, and I was there for about a year plus, taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about managing people from very different backgrounds. It taught me a lot about managing a very interesting sort of customer, you know, customer clientele who would come into the store. And then it taught me some really structured and interesting things that have to do with inventory systems and cash office management, et cetera. So it was it was a great experience. And it was one of those where it was a big risk mm-hmm. sort of getting <laughs> off of the sort of the hamster wheel of the job that I was on to do something so very different but for a good reason that would help me in my career moving forward. And it really did. You know, when you first talked about your sideways move, I was like, oh, that was a risk. You know, because it mm-hmm. almost, I think because it, we were just in the, in the last story you told, we were talking about success and what makes you successful. And I think, that, you know, that kind of move would be so counterintuitive to most people that it, it would almost seem like a step back rather than seeing it as a sideways move the way you did. But in retrospect, it was so brilliant, Katie, because it gave you the opportunity. It was an environment where you could, you know, get your hands in a lot of different areas of a business. Whereas when you work for a big company, it tends to be all siloed. So you don't get as much experience in the various pieces of the business and directly managing different personality types different backgrounds. What an amazing move. And that, and it gave you transferable skills that you could take to the next job. It did. And honestly, with all of sort of the the stressors that I had had and, and sort of some of the health issues that I was having based on those really within, you know, the first couple of weeks on this, on this new job, those started to go away (laughs) because yes, it was a different kind of stress, but it was, it was more of an atmosphere where I could thrive and enjoy myself and honestly be more active than sitting at a desk all day. And so I would say it helps sort of restore a little bit of my sanity and my health too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, let's, let's be very transparent. There's no getting rid of stress, but Mm -mm. there is a distinction between stress that motivates you right? You stress and stress that depletes you. And that's distress. And you're, it sounds like your old job distressed you. Whereas working at Barnes and Noble, it was that motivational stress, right? The stress that gets you up out of bed and charges you up for the day where you're like, I'm up against this today. I've got to be at my best. And it brings your best self forward without hurting your health or your peace of mind or anything like that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Love it. And this is a great segue, Katie, because what I'm curious about is your leadership style. You and I know that, you know, no two leaders are exactly the same. They don't do things exactly the same. And it's actually a good thing. And I, and I wish, you know, not that I wish, you know, my, um, My goal is to have more women realize that, that you can be yourself and be a great leader all at the same time. And there are subtle differences that we all bring to the table based on our personalities and our strengths and our experience and our interests. So Katie, how would you describe your leadership style? I would say two things. And I would say, you know, these are sort of navel gazing and how I would how I would present myself. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's just my own opinion. I would say two things. Uh, humble, hopefully, humble leadership and hyper organized. And I will explain both. So I think the humble leadership and, and that sort of feeds into servant leadership as well is is not taking a leadership position because you want it to be all about you. And now that's nice. And, you know, so if someone sees you as a leader, some of that's going to happen. But also you want to be able to lead an organization or a department or a group towards a a goal or a a higher purpose. And I think that the, the humble piece of that is, you know, having enough humility to surround yourself with people who will challenge you who will not always say yes, who will provide dissent. Um, and, and, and I always like the whole thing about, you know, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. I love that. And I think that's, that those are wise words. I have met some folks in leadership in different organizations who don't like that. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want, uh, you know, they want to be the final decision on everything. And that's just not me. I think that, that leading people, you want people to want to advance in that company, department or group. And so you want them to eventually take your job, hopefully. You know, whether it's that, if, whether that's what they want or if they want to lead in different ways, you want to do what you can as a leader to inspire folks, but also to equip them with the leadership tools so they can be leaders themselves. So there's that piece of it. The hyper organized piece, I've been told by past, let's say, bosses and peers that, that that's a word or a phrase that they use to describe me as hyper organized. I like to create structures um, and organization. And it's not just because I'm geeky that way, (laughs) but that's part of it. It's more if you can create structure and flow and organization. and, And this is how I visualize it. If that is all working and you can get that to be sort of the machinery that's working, uh, then you can get out of the weeds and have those higher level strategic discussions. If you, if, if everything is disorganized and let's say no one knows what documents to reference or what part of the software to use or whatever, then you're only going to ever have discussions that are fighter firefighting those issues. Mm-hmm. Reactive. You're, yeah. Right. You're never going to get out of the weeds and be able to drive the business forward. And so, you know, when I come into a company or an organization, that's one of the things that I look at. Not that I want to sort of want to impose my will, but I always look at, are there ways in which we can create efficiencies? So we're not having people do busy work or we're not frustrating people with things that don't work. Let's, you know, elevate everyone out of the sort of busy work conversation to those more strategic thinking initiatives. Mm -hmm. And so, That's why I say hyper organized, because I like to look at that, because I do think that that is part of leadership is to make sure that you can get people sort of, you know, moving towards the organization goals versus just trying to find a spreadsheet over and over again. 
Right. It sounds like it's your superpower. And when it's your superpower, you can't help but bring it to the table. It's just a part of who you are. You bring it wherever you go. And as an organized person, you know, I appreciate other organized (laughs) people. So awesome. And Katie, tell us about one thing that you're working on right now that you are super excited about and want to share with us. I would love to. So as you had mentioned in the intro, this year I am the president of the Junior League of Portland, Maine. And the presidency is a one-year term. And so it's exciting to to kind of get in and, and, you know, um, really see what I can do to help the organization during my year of service as president. One of the really exciting things for our Junior League this year is that we have a new issue area. And I'm going to explain all of what that means, but our new issue area is reaching youth at risk. And so we've got an organizational focus on the youth and the greater Portland community who are at risk in, for, you know, in various different ways and what our organization can do to assist them. Now, if I can back up just a little bit and give that some context. So our league has been around for 94 years, which is amazing. We are one of 291 junior leagues in four different countries. So it's not just our small group in Maine. This is an international movement, let's say, which started in the early 1900s with a small group of women making a change in their community. So what happens with these 291 leagues in four different countries is every individual league is embedded within their own community. And they look at what the needs are for their specific community and they try to affect change. So what is the specific need in the Portland, Maine community is going to be different than the need in the Tucson, Arizona community or the Minneapolis, Minnesota community or the Dallas, Texas community. And while we all uh, have similar structures in terms of organizational structures and how we raise money and how we train our women leaders is similar. How we affect change in each individual community is different. And with our league, we have had a number of different issues that we've focused on through the 94 years. And for those in the Portland community, they'll recognize things like the Children's Museum and the Children's Theater Uh, The Center for Giving Children, the Kids First Center, and the list goes on. And these are all organizations that we uh, helped found and provided funding and volunteer support for. So every, let's say, five to seven years, we take a look at what is the emerging need in the community? Because the need in our community now is very different than it was, let's say, 10 years ago. So that's why I'm so excited that right now we are embarking on this new issue area of reaching youth at risk with two amazing community partners. We're working with the Community Partnerships for Protecting Children, which is part of the Opportunity Alliance and the Maine Freedom Project. So CPPC, which is Community Partnerships for Protecting Children, is all about the prevention of child abuse and neglect. And the Maine Freedom Project is focused on human trafficking. As you can sort of hear the story, it's these big, huge, meaty issues that are really emerging in the Portland community. So it's really important and impactful for our league to be able to provide, um, you know, provide input and sort of help our community in in ways to help these youth at risk. So we're really excited. You know, and... Uh, What I really appreciated about the Junior League that you explained to me in some of our first conversations was that the change that the the league is making is not a stopgap. It's not like a temporary fix. These are well-researched issues, areas. You have partners in the community, and it's creating sustainable change that's handed over to the community so that the Junior League at, at some point will step away and it the change that they made will still be alive and thriving in the community. Exactly. And I think that's one of the benefits of the Junior Leagues around the world is that really is the model. It's not to get in and get out 
and do it quickly and just be volunteers for hire. That's so not our MO. It's really to do that deep, thoughtful research. Um, our research team met with pretty much all of the nonprofits that you can think of in the Portland area, as well as civic organizations and the police departments, et cetera, to really figure out what those needs are, but also hone in on some needs that may be either underfunded or underserved. Because we do have amazing community, community organizations like the United Way who are doing great work in different areas. So we don't necessarily need to piggyback exactly on what they are doing. We're going to find some community needs that, that, that need help that sort of need a spotlight on them as well. And oftentimes we can be that organization that also brings uh, disparate organizations together in the same room. That's perfect. And on the flip side of things, Katie, what would you say is the biggest leadership or business challenge that you're faced with currently? It's really interesting. And I think if you ask the folks in the league, they will agree. We have been around for 94 years, and yet the awareness around the Junior League of Portland is sort of minimal. If you if you talk to folks at, at, a, at a function, they may say, oh, junior achievement. Nope, different organization. <laughs> we, they really don't know our name or what we do. Yet, if you talk about the organizations that we have, you know, helped fund or helped start, they're well aware of the, those organizations. And so when they hear about the connection, they're amazed. Um, just recently, I was having a conversation about the work that we've done with Maine Medical Center and uh, their um, occupational therapy program. And it's really interesting. That is something that we started working on with um, Maine Medical Center and their predecessor um, in our, the first year of our founding, 1922. So for us, the biggest challenge is really getting our name out there uh, so people know who we are in the Portland community. And we have an amazing group of women in the league who work on public relations, who are really helping with that. And we're really working to equip all of our members to be, let's say, brand ambassadors um, to, to get the word out, because I think the more folks who know who we are, the the more women that we can uh, have join the league and be part of these wonderful um, community projects that we're working on. But also, I think that, you know, that helps bring in um, like minded organizations who may want to provide a sponsorship or um, a partnership in some way. So awareness is the biggest challenge that we have right now. Mm -hmm. And you're tackling it right here, right now, <laughs> as we mm -hmm. get this recording out into the world. And Katie, if you could tell us, tell us about the people that you have around you that support you to help you do what you do. Absolutely. I would say from the, you know, from the business perspective and from the junior league perspective, I am one person of the 200 plus members that we have. I just happen to be in the president position this year. We have an amazing board of directors. We have an amazing leadership team of uh, chairs and assistant chairs. And I would say every single member that we have is a community leader. So surrounded by 200 amazing women is quite an amazing support team, a very hefty support team uh, that surrounds me. On a personal level, I will say that my husband makes it all happen. <laughs> he is the he's the biggest supporter. And as we have had a really big life shift with bringing in um, children into our household who are three and twins and active, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's really stepped in a lot, provided, I would say, a lot of coverage um, as I have been, you know, continuing to do my work with the league and some of the other um, market research work that I do. He's really a huge support in making all of that possible, um, you know, from from a logistic standpoint, as well as a moral support standpoint. Mm -hmm. He's a hero. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes. And Katie, now I'm going to do a quick leadership roundup. So tell us, what is one practice you have that helps to make you a better leader? I think hmm, I, I'm not going to say this well, I think <laughs> I'm just going to say it. I think one of the practices that I, I try to do is I'm going to say check my own biases. 
and sort of think about the filter that I'm looking at a situation through because my filter for something might be very different than someone else's. And so when I'm tackling a, a work situation or a junior league situation or a home situation, I try to take a step back for a moment and say, okay, my, my like inherent bias going into this is X, Y, and Z. And I need to know that because that's how I'm going to approach this problem or this issue or this question. And I hopefully, like, hopefully that makes me a better leader slash mom slash wife slash business person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because that hopefully makes me a little bit more aware. Am I always really good at this? No. But I will say that sometimes in retrospect, it helps me come around to things, too. Um, I've had some great training uh, through the Junior League in terms of, you know, some of those different personality profiles and things like that. One of my favorite is the Berkman. And I'm very red when it comes to Berkman. So I've been able to sort of look at that and say, OK, my own actions and how I take action on a problem is usually quick and decisive and working with only the information that I have. And sometimes that doesn't work so well with folks who need to take a little bit more time and be thoughtful and gather more information. So if I know going in that the lens I'm looking through is a very action oriented lens versus a data gathering lens, that helps me have better conversations. And what is one book that you would recommend to a woman to help her develop her leadership? See, and I, I used to manage a bookstore, so asking me for one book is... <laughs> and it's torture, isn't it? <laughs> really, really hard. I'm going to give you a couple and you can't stop me. Uh, <laughs> I will always say the books, and there are multiple ones on servant leadership, are fantastic. I think everyone should read them. I think that is the, 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 the way, the path of leadership that I think is the most authentic and and. It's my favorite. I will just say that. Um, so there's that. A very sort of not obscure but sort of unusual choice is a book called Exploiting Chaos by Jeremy Gucci. And it's not anything about women or leadership specifically, but it's all about being comfortable and taking action in in times of change. And, you know, in his words, in times of chaos. But that's his whole thing. How do you exploit the chaos to move the business forward? It's a fascinating quick read. And it's not talked about a lot, but it's one that I love. I'm going to have to check it out. And what advice would you give your younger self? Oh, God. <laughs> it kind of goes back to one of the things we were saying before. The advice I would give my younger self is don't worry, you're going to get there. You know, it, it's not going to be instantaneous, but you're going to get to where you need to be. I'm a very impatient person. I will tell you that. And my husband will certainly tell you that. <laughs> so having that patience um, and, and being able to sit in a period and in a, in a, in a sort of sense of um, unknowing, but having the faith that you'll get there. And share with us a success quote or a mantra and why it has meaning for you. Hmm. I have two. I have two. <laughs> I can't just pick one, but I think they're very different. When we went through some, I would say, real struggles in the adoption process, there were real crises of faith and real, you know, I would say dark time um, as we went through that process. I, you know, I'm a religious person. So yeah, there are some great Bible quotes. I will say Ephesians, I think it's 2.10, which is the one, and I do this from memory. Um, it's like, for we are God's handiwork, um, created in Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. I love that because I'm like, okay, the path is there. You got to trust. You got to trust. You got to trust. I love that one. The other one is from a book called Dear Universe, Letters of Affirmation and Empowerment for All of Us. The author is Yolo Akili, and it's a longer quote. I actually pulled this up because I want to read it, and it's called A Message from the Universe, and it says, remember, your story can help save someone's life. Your silence contributes to someone else's struggle. Speak so we all can be free. Love so we all can be liberated. The moment is now, and we need you. 
And I love that. I love that one too. <laughs> I'm going to take that one with me. Mm-hmm. Lastly, Katie, what is the best way for this community to connect with you? All across social media. I'm all <laughs> everywhere. 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 <laughs> I would say the best places, you know, Twitter is one of the best places. Um, I know you'll put this in the show notes, but at Insight Scal is my handle across pretty much all of the different platforms. So Twitter and Instagram are probably the, the quickest ways to, to connect with me. Gosh, and like I'm all, also on Pinterest and Snapchat and WeChat and, 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 and the list goes on. If they want to find you, they'll find you. They'll find me. (laughs) Nice. Awesome. And for those of you listening, I know you're often on the go and you know, you can find all the links and resources that Katie shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com. And Katie, thank you so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. We are all better for having met you. Oh, thank you, Jody. That is so kind. And it's been such fun talking to you. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Are you ready to take the lead in your own life but need some support? Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash contact to introduce yourself. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining with me and here's to your success.